the total number of family offices here rose to 720, 21, um, up from 420, 20, and uh, in 2018, there were only 50, but right now, the number is close to about 1,500. Mm. Yeah, and uh, of course, as you can see, since early part of last year, um, there's already a minimum fund size of 10 million. So uh, I think our government has already raised this and they're going to raise this even more because they realize there's a huge influx of Chinese family uh, offices being set up here. And uh, But this is surprising because this is on Taiwan and they talk about the fact uh, on Hong Kong as well. So if you look at uh, what happened was that in 2022, Hong Kong lost 3,000 high net worth individuals while Singapore gained 2,800 What's your first thought of this, uh, you know? Please don't tell me that you're thinking where did the, the balance 200 went to? The Liang Bai Okay, so why did all of that come in? <laughs> okay. So the question is, why do foreigners want to set up family offices in Singapore, Melvin? Yeah, why? I'm asking you. Why? Uh, don't, don't ask me. It's all in my nuggets on the go. Why? Why? <laughs> what did... Okay. So, of course, I think like generally, uh, I would still think that Singapore is a safe haven. Mm. Uh, naturally, as uh, the Chinese wealth increased over the last few years, there is a need for them to find a way that, that they can actually park their wealth and diversi- de- diversify their wealth in an international level. Uh, and if I'm a foreigner, what will attract me from a Singapore space? Of course, I have uh, heard of uh, funds coming in to participate in the shop houses for the last few years. Mm. We also have uh, family offices that are created such that uh, they can actually eventually take part in uh, the commercial shop house spaces. Right. Because this is still <coughs> a space that you can in- invest in Singapore properties. You can own land, but you don't have to pay that additional buyer stamp duty of 30%. We actually, you know, like we've increased it all the way until 30%. So I think uh, that is one attraction factor. And of course, I would say that uh, from a real estate market standpoint, uh, Singapore, because of the cooling measures that have been set up for the last 12 years, right? Uh, our market is very, very different, mm. right? So while uh, the whole world is, you know, like battling with uh, high interest rates, uh, you can see that interest rates affect other property markets, other countries, right? In a more, uh, how do I say, like in a, in a, in a more like one-to-one kind of manner. So meaning that interest rate increase, your affordability straight away will reduce significantly. Yeah, correlation is very strong. Correlation is very strong. Yes, yeah. that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. But in Singapore, <laughs> this correlation is not so strong. Rational is because total debt servicing ratio were introduced back in uh, 2013. While interest rate is actually under 1.5%, the banks have already been lending at 3.5%. Mm. And, and hence, in general, when interest rate go up, of course, affordability still reduces. For example, we use the recent uh, uh, research that we did was uh, now, banks are using stress tests between 4.5 to 4.75%. Mm. If we were to compare using a stress test of 4% to 4.75%, the affordability reduces by 8.5% in terms of the loan amount that you can get, right? So, uh, but of course, it is not as significant as like, you know, like, uh, like a, a huge reduction of like maybe up to like 20%, assuming that we are always giving based on the prevailing interest rate at the moment. Right. Mm. Yeah. This is also a, a, a macro view of um, the flow of money. So in our last webinar, we talked about the fact that um, there's this this distinguished... Um, how do I say it? What, what is that? It's not distinguished. Uh, this classification of soft to hard to harder assets. So if you look at this this uh, table that we had, we shared this during our webinar number five on uh, TOP versus new launch and resale. Soft to hard is a situation whereby um, not just on the topic of price elasticity. So we, we describe about the elasticity behavior of price to quantity um, based on the hardness of the asset. So when an asset is harder, uh, supply fire seems very hard to rush in. And um, you when you own this kind of asset, you got to enjoy the price appreciation over the years. So for example, if you own a landed property or you own a freehold commercial shop house, when price increase, there's no way that the supply can be increased. So you got to enjoy the valuation appreciation of this particular asset that you're holding. So if you hold a HDB property, when price increase, it attracts government policy immediately to stifle sub- demand and to increase supply. And thus your price then stagnates. Now, this um, why is this correlated to this article that we're talking about? Is because this is also a behavior on a macro basis that 
people will want to transfer their wealth and money to somewhere that is safer, to somewhere that is harder. Harder in the sense that it's more certain. Government policy is certain. The country is, is safer. Um, the currency is strong. Strong governance. And of course, uh, is welcoming to foreigners. And thus, you, you get to see Singapore a little bit like... Um, you know, uh, in the past, a lot of people like to park their funds in certain countries, right? Mm. Yeah, because uh, of the safe haven status. But now it seems that in this era, in 2022, 2023, why have we gotten this kind of dominant status? And I think uh, it was actually sprouted out from the pandemic. What, mm. what do you think about this, uh, Jimmy? In fact, I, I agree very strongly with you because uh, when you were posing the question to Irong earlier on, I was just thinking to myself, why is it suddenly that after 2020 season, we start seeing a lot more family offices being set up? You showed mm. the numbers earlier on. 2018 yeah. was only 50. Now we're closing to what 200, I believe. Yeah. Um, and I think it stems from the strong governance that we had uh, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic season, every country was facing the same problem. And I think um, governments worldwide were looking at one another and think and and trying to see what other governments are doing, mm. right? Because it's the first time everyone is dealing with this uh, pandemic. Nobody knows the answer to it, but everybody is watching one another to see who has the best solution. And uh, if they have a solution that works, we follow that and we go down the same road, right? right? Um, and I think gov the Singapore government did a fantastic job. Um, of course, at the start, when, when cases were flying up, everybody was thinking, was saying, uh, is the government, does the government know what they're doing? Um, are we safe and all that kind of thing but right. I think time and again the government has proven that uh, they can get problems solved um, it might take a bit of time but eventually the the roadmap to to getting to the solutions are there mm -hmm. and I think since the pandemic onwards um, everybody has seen Singapore as a very stable country um, if something goes uh, something hits the fan the government has solutions to deal with it. Right. And I think that is the main reason why from 2018 onwards, we see a sharp rise in, in family offices being set up here. Yeah.